<laughs> Are those birds outside chirping a little too loud? Well, just fucking kill them! Now, I would like to nominate Vladimir Putin. Ding, zing, I'ma sting you. <laughs> cool. Streams live 24-7. Destiny. Everything. Xbox Live. Bitching about pennies. We'll have hundreds of movies. Oh. They have the internet on computers now. Yup. Oh, neat. You've got mail. Hello. Mosaic. And it all started... Well, technically it started with the bomb. Then again, Nikola Tesla wanted to build, like, the electricity internet with the infrastructure of cat piss and mud. But for simplicity's sake, let's go back to the bomb. The atomic bomb was the biggest collab ever between the two ends of George Washington High School. The OG Wittwa, when scientists tried to help, they were basically told that this toy shop's going to the war. And we don't need nerds tell us how to waste human life. <laughs> Vannevar Bush saw this malarkey firsthand, and when the sequel Hitler asked for came around, he wanted to change things. Bush pushed FDR to create a government office to help scientists get an in with the military to make gadgets for the war, like radar. He then kicked FDR's four-term ass to start the Manhattan Project, where he curated the moving parts behind the scenes to help Oppenheimer and Groves drop <laughs> That summer, he wrote, as we may think, a slightly more serious Elon Musk diary about why we needed to keep the science-government collab alive in peacetime. The Cliff Notes is basically, if we can use our minds to destroy the world, maybe we can use them to save it. And if not that, at least make it less shitty before we eventually do. He was talking about GoPros, PCs, point-of-sale tech. He saved the best idea for last, though. The Memex. What the hell is a Memex? A future device with slanting screens, a keyboard, and storage for all your books, news, tabloids. In a sense, the first prototype of a desktop computer. You're on a Teddy Roosevelt kick and you want an information reel on his alpha life. Enter the code and there you go. If you want to pull up something on the OG fat man looking to understand why TR split his own party to run against him that one time after they were friends, you can pull up both at the same time. If you want to link the two together to not lose your place, you can do that with a code that you can set up to take you right there. And if you don't, someone else will. Fast forward 15 years and a couple of pupils of the essay look at this thing and say, what a piece of shit. Ted Nelson and Doug Engelbart went separate ways, but each had a similar idea. Put the memix concept of a linking library of information on one of these. <laughs> At the time, computers were strictly viewed as very thick. There was no overarching network to connect one to the other to form like a Google Doc of brain power, so they were pretty slow. Typewriters were still the way to go for writing. Nobody worked a computer screen doing this formatting text bullshit. That's it! Click your screen, click TR, and you warp to another set of TR qualities. Click on one of them, and there you go. It was a pretty cool idea. Only Nelson could never get it out of his head onto the computer itself until way later. He did consult with someone who could, though. Andy Nelson and his team of students at Brown applied the hypertext idea to an actual system on an IBM Stone Boy. Only instead of just reading down rabbit holes, Andy figured you should be able to write your own, too. Hence the name, Hypertext Editing System. You can move text wherever you want. Copy, cut, paste, link, print, whatever. Microsoft Word without rules, coupled with the Teddy Roosevelt library. It's pretty cool, right? Andy, whose son was in Toy Story, did have papers printed with his system go up with the moon men after initial pushback from bosses. But he wasn't the first to show the general public what his baby could do. So I have a copy of that statement and all numbers numbered statements. Well, I'm going to do something called jump on a link. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. The graphics aren't anything special. That controller looks like a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they call a bug fight. 
The combat does not look like much. But to people like Andy, Doug Engelbart's online system may as well have been to for about five seconds. As crazy as this looks for 1968, this was a year before the US prototype of the ARPANET launched as a military experiment. And when two computers hooked up for the first DM 350 miles away from each other, the most the ARPANET could handle was oh. You were never meant to play Doug's game at home let alone with someone else in another county. The technology just wasn't there yet. So the US, London, France, Ann Arbor, Michigan, for some reason, and started laying down bigger networks through the 70s, mostly for the military, IBM, and university computers to send hugs and kisses over this little thing called email and figure out what the hell the internet is. At the same time, a bunch of Engelbart disciples in Palo Alto thought they had a pretty good idea of what the Memix hypercomputer gen thing was supposed to be. The Xerox Alto. It brought Engelbart's setup from the lab to the home. It's got rendered windows with menus, a simple keyboard, a mouse, a setup that for 1973, it's, it's feeling pretty familiar. The Xerox Alto that Xerox never sold to the public. In exchange for one million big ones in his new company stock, they also invited someone to the office to check it out in 1979. When he asked for a demo of this thing, Xerox then made the research team that designed it give him the secret formula in a box of quiz. Okay, they didn't give him like a physical copy or code of this thing, like a little cereal box CD-ROM game. That would've been extra stupid. All they showed was a classified demo to Steve Jobs. I thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen in my life. You can tell he's being serious because he immediately tore it apart. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong. Every machine that was or wasn't Orwellian in the 80s, every solitaire galactic pinball Oregon trail box in the 90s, every lime wire brick, words per minute speed run, death insurance simulator, math robot, impossible trick, torture. Owes its design inspiration to the team that built this thing. While that was happening, the networks built in the 70s are starting to collab under a universal language to make things easier to connect to more computers. An internet of internets. internets. The other Bush was possibly talking about. But for the radar men, tech boys, and profs that were actually on the net, it was still a hassle to find each other. Imagine you had to type this lovely collection of numbers and decimals every time you wanted to get to YouTube. Now imagine doing that for every single website. And also the number might change, so if it does, you have to call the ARPANET help desk server to get a new one again. But you better do it during the day because it's one lady and her team handling all these addresses in one file. You know what? It can wait. Elizabeth Feinler, human Google herself, was probably sick of being that, so as the folder filled up to hundreds of addresses, her team started organizing the pile by domain names. .com for tech, .gov for military, .exe for- Oh, hello, Satan! The system had more help desk servers, too, so now you could register, look up, and find who you need to talk to not only easier, but 24-7. That, coupled with access kinda opening up a little bit by the end of the 80s, we're so cl we're close. Only the tools getting us there aren't. There wasn't one all-encompassing page reader slash maker for all computers to connect to. Each one was playing ping pong with itself. Computers getting into homes is cool, but people can draw, play music, play games, balance the books, play stock market before October, do all these things without a Commodore 64. Plus, hey, you play Castlevania? <laughs> Okay, bad example. The internet's collabing under one language is also good, and being able to surf is great. You know, for the people who knew how, which was anyone but the general public. The world is wider, it just needs something to tie it together, you know, like a string, a tape, a unifier, velcro, a xanadu, uh, a mesh, yes, yes, that's it, a mesh. Wumba? Tim Berners-Lee of Switzerland was inspired by all the boys before him and wanted to make his own TR hypertext reader slash maker with links and shit. Only his, though, was gonna work on all computers. Be the information web that would link the growing internet user base and its addresses to not just 
communicate, but share a bottomless collection of wisdom. Be something that would change the world as we know it. So he made a phone book. One that any of his fellow co-workers could access around the world was a more concrete cell of the system he used to make it, a project called the World Wide Web. It's another copy of the hyper page master link browser idea that so many people have refined over the years, but with a simple language that every computer could understand each other with. And the battle begins. <laughs> click to go to a website, your computer sends the click to the World Wide Web, who understands perfectly, and hits you back with where you're going. As you surf, it's an endless rally. Till the Wi-Fi cuts. In 1991, with a little help from his intern Nicola and grad student Henrik, he was able to indeed make the World Wide Web browser accessible to any computer hooked up to an internet server that spoke the language. But it didn't, you see. To get the phone book to come up on any and every computer, Nicola and Henrik had to strip it back from the sexy interactive playground to... this. It's fine for phone numbers and nuclear war, but... So, in 1993, he gave it away. Floating around in the public domain, free to be explored and expanded upon by anyone. Someone modded the browser to look cooler and easier to use. A couple more did too. A few people started using it. Someone even ordered a pizza. A few more companies started selling access to it. You just give it a second here, it's getting there. Almost. Then more people started using it. Which led to even more websites. More websites for buying porn. More websites for creative porn. For making fucking money. For searching for more porn. Making fuck my money! Exchanging illegally downloaded music. Exchanging what you thought was illegally downloaded like music. Paid. Writing papers on Teddy Roosevelt. Getting laid. Getting laid and married. Pending beliefs. Hating everyone hoping they die. Finding that one video that you couldn't find on the internet anywhere. I'll just make a website myself and put it there. I don't know, maybe other people will use it. Which leads to even more users. Plus it's faster. And has more applications. Creatively berate your peers all over the world. Listen to music legally. Checks out. An iPod. A phone. <laughs> and an internet communicator. I don't get it. Oh. Here's my hope. The web is a tool for communicating. With the web, you can find out what other people mean. You can find out where they are coming from. The web can help people understand each other. Think about most of the bad things that have happened between people in your life. Maybe most of them come down to one person not understanding another. Even worse, let's use the web to create neat, new, exciting things. Let's use the web to help people understand each other. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs>